Hi, Gary. Hi, Bob. How you doing? I'm doing pretty well, although after a couple months of book publicity, I thought I had successfully crawled back to my writer's cave, but now you're dragging me out again. And I so sought you see, out. <laughs> yes, I, I even had to shave for this, which is not something that I normally do. You shaved? Because, yes. you know, meanwhile, Bob is sporting a little vacation uh, I, facial growth. I here. saw that on a recent dialogue. I saw that. I, I assume it's an homage to me? It, yeah, 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 very much. Good, good. Um, you're exactly the person I had in mind when I when I uh, woke up and said, I really don't feel like shaving today. Right. Um, so, uh, well, you are a famous writer. Uh, I mean, first we should, I guess, admit uh, to being friends. Um, friends of how many years? 32 years. I don't think we want 30. to get into that. Um, <laughs> okay. the, the, uh, but we actually knew each other in college, although not that well. We got to know each other. No, better. it was. It, I was trying to remember that it was after college that we really got to know each other. We had a discussion about Einstein at some house in Philadelphia or something. And I yeah, and the rest is and the rest is yeah. history. Um, and then when we were both living in Brooklyn as upstart and or aspiring writers, right, right. And, uh, a little later, we got to know each other. But anyway, you've got this book, uh, City of Scoundrels. That I did. got that got a second wave of publicity. It came it came out several months ago, but then the, because the New York Times was a little late with its glowing review, and it actually was a very nice review. Oh, that's nice. It was. You're happy with it, right? I am. I am. I you know I have all kinds of conspiracy theories about why it was four months late, but we won't get into those. Why don't we get into one? No, no. no. Uh, okay. I won't go there. <laughs> okay. Um. Um, okay, so we're going to talk about your book, City of Scoundrels, um, and other matters, uh, including writing in general, the writing life, things like that, why your book seems to be favored, um, kind of surprisingly, by conservatives, conservatives, right? I mean, I say surprisingly well, only, only, but only because it has no overt <laughs> political content, right? Uh, yeah, and I, I don't think it's there's much evidence for a widespread. Uh, uh, well, the Weekly Standard. I mean, that's basement. the Weekly Standard. Uh, let me before you. I tell you what. Why don't you hold up the book while I read a quote from the Weekly Standard? Oh God. Okay. All right. Okay. This is gonna, we're going to sell some copies because you know we got right. literally scores of people watching us right now, <laughs> and I think we can sell some copies. Okay. All right. Chris. Christ employs an easy, enthusiastic hand to unpack all that research into a raucous, briskly paced, thoroughly American tale. That's probably the part they liked, that it was American. Thoroughly American tale that provides moments of great comedy and tragedy along with a steady diet of spectacular calamity. You can't do better than that for a selling blur. Yeah, that was nice. Uh, I was grateful for it. Um, so, before you... Give us a theory, if you will, about why the Weekly Standard liked it. Not that everyone else didn't, but I mean, uh, uh, whether there is some spe some special appeal to conservatives. Oh, uh, you want to tell us a little bit about what the book is about? It's an historical book. It's a history book. It's about Chicago in 1919. I um, wanted to write a book about an American city at a crucial point in its evolution. Um, I think that cities go through a kind of... Darwinian evolution, something that you would surely agree with. Uh, and it's particularly dramatic, I think, in a city of immigrants like Chicago, um, which also grew up very quickly from, from nothing in the space of a couple decades. So I was almost using Chicago as kind of a test case for the whole American idea of heterogeneous democracy. That Could this wildly diverse group of people from every corner of the globe really come together and despite numerous ethnic hatreds and uh, racial hatreds and competing interests, turn this former frontier village into one of the economic powerhouses of the globe. And of course, the short answer to that, as we now know, is yes. But there were times, as in the period I write about, which is basically July of 1919, when it looked as if the whole experiment was going to just come crashing down under the weight of too many different groups of people wanting too many different things. Mm -hmm. um, so these were, you're focusing on a very small time frame, right? It's like, it's like two weeks where a whole bunch of weird stuff happened. 
Right. Well, I, there is preface to the to the uh, twelve day period that I'm focusing on. Uh, I talk about Chicago more or less. At, at, at the beginning of 1919, being in a very optimistic, hopeful state, you know, the war was over, the influenza epidemic uh, that had been raging through the city for much of 1918 was finally tapering off, crime was down, and they, had, they were really getting behind this great vision of the future, the plan of Chicago. This was uh, architect Daniel Burnham's grand redevelopment scheme that was going to rebuild Chicago from top to bottom and mm -hmm. turn it into what he called the Paris of the Prairie. Um, the basic idea was if you make a more pleasant and orderly urban environment, the people living in it will become more pleasant and uh, orderly. But that's not and the way it happened in Chicago. Yeah. But is it was it his initiative that led to that distinctive kind of recessed Waterfront, you might say, in Chicago, where the buildings don't come up to the water's edge, and they're right. Yeah, yeah. His his plan. It was a comprehensive plan that included uh, beachfront parks and things like mm -hmm. that. A lot of it wasn't built. I mean, parks. most of it wasn't built. Um, but um, it was it was really a, a revolutionary uh, urban design uh, innovation, and. Mm -hmm. um, and they were finally getting getting some traction on this uh, when the post-war tensions just built up over the course of 1919 and uh, ultimately sort of made a mockery of that whole visionary uh, idea of an ideal society in an ideal environment. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you had all, all the sold. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, you had all these soldiers coming back from World War I, and meanwhile, during the war, uh, a lot of African-American workers had come north to fill the wartime uh, labor shortage. This was the beginning of the Great Migration. And they were all descending on the city right at the time when the post-war economy was winding back down after, after the war effort. So there was tremendous competition for housing and, and jobs. And all of this just built up over the course of the year until finally, uh, in July, the city was hit by this bizarre 12-day period of disasters that kind of just lit the match for the conflagration. Right, and a, a certain number of the ingredients were more or less random things, like right. weird, weird mid-air collision with buildings or something, right. and, like, and, like, <laughs> was... and like abducted young girl and stuff. And, right. Right. But, it's, but, it starts that way. There, there was a, a blimp crash, the first major okay. aviation disaster in American history. This blimp was uh, doing a test flight over the loop of Chicago because it, this was not perceived as dangerous at the time. And it mysteriously caught fire and ended up crashing right through the skylight of the Illinois Trust and Savings Bank in the, in the financial district of Chicago and ended up killing 13 people. And, and uh, But really shocking the whole the whole city into you know who what could be more safe than a staid bank in the middle of a downtown financial district mm -hmm. so there was a sense of new urban dangers and i think the abduction and murder of a six-year-old child that happened the very next day that played into it it was a child molester situation uh that also traumatized the city but um it was really when things really got rolling was um on one of those classic hot Sunday afternoons when an incident at a south side beach just spiraled into one of the worst race riots in American history. It went on for several days with people just brutally killing each other on the streets. Mm -hmm. uh, and two days into that, there was a major transit strike uh, that basically shut down all of the streetcars and L trains in Chicago. So everybody was thrown onto the street uh, right in the middle at the height of the violence. So it was... Uh, there was really a sense that the, the city was coming apart at the seams, and uh, they weren't getting any leadership from their mayor or their governor. Okay. Um, and on the racial front, how how did that how did those tensions uh, well progress and finally, I guess, resolve themselves? You mean after the riot or or before? Y y well, I mean mainly after, I guess. I mean, I mean, is is the idea that this was a, a two weeks in which Chicago passed some kind of test that was a prerequisite for further evolution? Uh, yeah, I think so. I mean, it set race race relations 
for the foreseeable future in, in Chicago. Uh, there was a de facto color line developing in Chicago, but after the race riots, it, it developed, uh, it just hardened that color line. And um, it left a legacy of, of segregation that some would say persists to this day. I mean, Chicago remains one of the most segregated cities mm -hmm. in, the, in the country. But interestingly, a lot of black leaders afterwards thought that the riots had a silver lining because they said that, um, uh, you know, they sort of galvanized the African-American community to finally demand their rights. You know, they had performed well as soldiers in, in the war, and they came back and expected to be treated differently, and they were not. And this is, this is regarded as one of the first race riots where blacks aggressively fought back and sometimes were even the aggressors in certain incidents. Hmm. Um, okay, now had this, had this period been identified in the way you identify it before you did so? I mean, for example, had anybody uh, singled out these two weeks as of special significance? I mean, the race riots were obviously Yeah, well known. the race riots were well known. There had been a book, a quite good book, uh, academic press book written about the race riots. Um, and I started out wanting to maybe re-examine the race riots alone, and then I found out all of this other stuff was going on uh, at the same time, and I became intrigued with the local city politics. And so, um, you know, I, I consider myself in the narrative business as much as in the history business, and, and uh, I, I saw a good narrative here. And, um, you know, there is some argument that maybe the blimp crash had nothing to do with the race riot, and uh, there is some justice there, but it, it, it makes a good narrative, I think. And I, right. I do think that they all contributed to this overall sense in the city that, you know, if, if one-tenth of the things that were going on in Chicago in this two-week period were going on in any American city today, right. they would think that they had an emergency, a, a major crisis, and uh, this was ten times worse, so. Right. So you're not uh, you're not you're not claiming the connection between like the blimp crash and the and the race riots, or are you, are you are you saying that the sense of peril actually increased the chances of racial tension? I don't explicitly say that, but I do believe that. You do? I do believe that there were there was a very tense uh, atmosphere that was exacerbated by things like a, a blimp crashing into a downtown bank and a six-year-old child who was abducted and murdered by a neighbor. Uh, there was this real sense that, well, our neighbors are maybe not our friends, and that was certainly corroborated in the race riot uh, that closely followed on it. Yeah. I mean, it's kind of an interesting question. You said you're not in story and you're a narrative writer, but to what extent the two kind of professions are linked in the sense that I almost get the sense with some historians sometimes that if a sequence of events does make for a good narrative, to them that is validation of the decision to treat the sequence of events as unified. You know what I mean? In other words, are historians yeah. really playing by much stricter rules than you're playing by? <laughs> I mean... Uh. Well, I, any any interpretation of history, if you look at the raw facts of history, when you go through the newspaper microfilms, when you go through the archives and things like that, what you see is chaos. Uh, and so you historians cherry pick just the way we narrative historians do. Uh, mm -hmm. In order to create any kind of coherence, you have to decide what is noise and what is significant. So mm -hmm. there's, you know, the... The thing that you don't want to do is impose a narrative beforehand and decide that, you know, you have this preconceived notion that you, you know, you want the, the New Deal not to be about government saving uh, the country. You want it to be about the government depressing the country. And so you impose a different kind of narrative on, uh, on the, the raw facts of, of history. Um, <clears throat> but to a certain extent, yes, you are selecting just as a novelist in selects details in reality to create a narrative, you're you're uh -huh. selecting what you uh, deem is important in the narrative in the uh, historical record, mm -hmm. and uh, deciding this is the story I want to tell, because you know, uh, particularly in a city like Chicago with so many different groups and so many things going on at once, 
it's hard to say exactly where are there any through lines here at all because it's always something you know <laughs> even even when I you know I drew my narrative to a close at a certain point and then you read the next day's paper and there's something else going on and uh-huh. and so there is an artificiality to what I do and and I think what all historians do but there has to be otherwise you can't just present the chaos unadulterated yeah because, I mean, you know, there is this, we, everyone, we all want to believe and be able to say that whatever we're writing about is close to the most important thing in the world. I mean, you know, <laughs> right, your, book right. tour, your book tour steers you toward that messaging, and you need to kind of believe it to get through the project. And so, you know, there's all these, there's these, uh, there's a genre of book that will take something like a spice, like, you know, pepper, you know, the prism right. through which world history the should be viewed. The spice that changed the, the world, right. The spi- yeah, there actually is a book, like, on, 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 there's a book on, there's probably a book on every spice, and, and, I don't know, but, but, There's uh, a, a book on the color mauve, and how it changed the world. <laughs> You're kidding. Um, are you serious? A lot of that is just... No, wait, Gary, Gary, we have to get yeah. this clear. Are you serious, or is that... Yes, look it up. Uh, there's a book called Mauve, the Die That Changed the World, or something, something. It came out about ten years ago, or something like that. Ah, well, there is that, that Phoenician purple. Is that what they're talking about? <laughs> that was big. It's that a, was a big. That I was big. It was like some, some popular cult, uh, color in Victorian dress, and I, I don't really yeah. know enough about the book to say what the author was talking about. Yeah. But uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of times these... Uh, these things exist only in subtitles, uh, and to a certain extent, right. that exists in my book. I mean, it was a subtitle that the publisher decided would be a good subtitle to make the book seem more important than it really is. <laughs> and what is the subtitle? Remind us. Uh, the Twelve Days of Disaster That Gave Birth to Modern Chicago. Well, at least they stopped in Chicago. They didn't say the modern world or, you know... Uh, the fundamental structure of the universe. Right, exactly. That shows a lot of restraint. They were saying those subtitles for your next book, Bob. (laughs) Thank you for reminding me of that book. Um, Uh So, uh, okay, so anything else you want to say about the book? I want to talk a little ultimately about, like, your your career and about writing broadly and stuff, but, but what else do you want to say about the book? Oh, no, I don't want to say anything else about the book. (laughs) Gary, you are a marketing disaster, man. (laughs) That's that's a great great thing to say, Uh, you know, when uh, you've got a book out. I don't want to talk about the book. Should I say it's a New York Times bestseller? Is it a New York Times bestseller? Only say it if it's a lie. No, it it is. This this was an eye-opening experience for me. It made the bottom of the extended New York Times bestseller list for one week. And I have seen the paperback that they're doing of the book, and it says, and it says New York, New York Times, Times bestseller. bestseller. Right, you know. And I won't complain. I'm not. I won't complain. I'm. I'm complaining. You know why? Because, why? like, okay, so most of our careers were spent in this world where, in order to be called a New York Times bestseller, you had to crack the top fifteen, right? The list right. that appears in the paper, New York Times. And I never had one do that ever, ever, ever. And finally, my last book does that, so it can be called the New York Times bestseller by the old standards. But no, no, no. inflation is hit. down the, the whole right. distinction. Right, I mean, now the term is so wide that your book, Gary, for God's sake. <laughs> Even my book, yes. Oh. oh, the indignity of it. Well, anyway, congratulations on your New York Times bestseller, Anne. Thank you. Uh, and let's keep it hush-hush about the fact that, you know, it's the extended list. Right. Okay. The we can the, we can edit um, that out. Okay. So uh, so anyway, about your uh, your your uh, my checkered you career, my brilliant career. No, is it my brilliant career or movie? That's a movie, isn't it? Uh, that, that was a movie. Yeah. Okay, your brilliant career. So it's an interesting career path. Now, it's often to say it's common to say nonfiction writers are frustrated fiction writers. And you are a former fiction writer, but you're not really a frustrated one, I would say. I mean, in the sense that your first book of short stories, The Garden State, uh, which I read even in draft form, um, won the Sue Kaufman uh, First Fiction Prize. And that's not a super 
well-known prize, but it's actually very significant, right? Because it's put out by, what, the American Academy of Arts and Letters, which, right. unbeknownst to many people, is kind of the the thing in this realm, right? I mean, the, like, John... Well, like when you the look, Academy of, of it's all the, of our great writers. Okay, and it's this award for first fiction, and they just give one every year. So so they they look at everyone who's published their first fiction book, and they say, well, this was the best one, and yours was the best one that year, and you went to this thing, and like, who, John Updike was there at the award ceremony or something, right? Right, he was. He was standing right next to my father, which was kind of interesting. Now, that's an interesting juxtaposition. <laughs> did, he, did he ask your father how the meat business was going? <laughs> <laughs> no, but I was afraid my father would ask him a question about the meat business. Uh. <laughs> we should say, by way of background, that your father worked for either Hormel or Swift. Swift. Swift and Company. Swift. That's why he was very happy when I started writing a Chicago book, because he used to go out there all the time. Although he says, I never liked Chicago. Uh, so, Still. Still. Um, so anyway, uh, you were, and, and it was in glowing reviews for that book. Um, and you wrote another book of short stories. And it stories. sold, I can't tell you how many it sold. I mean, the paperback sold a little bit more, but the, the hardback sold, like, I don't even think it sold 5,000 copies. Okay, well, there's two. So two, you can't live on that, you know? No, you can't live on that. Uh, the, um, so it, does that explain why before long you quit writing sh books of short stories? And, and would you say that that's more a comment on short stories as, a, as, a, as an implausible commercial enterprise or on really serious literary fiction unless you happen to become the, you know, the person? And there's a certain amount of randomness associated with who becomes the person, I think. Right, yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't know how it's done, but at any given time, there are 15 or 20 fiction books that are deemed the things you have to read, whether it's the publishers making that decision by how they allocate their marketing resources or the mm -hmm. bookstores. I don't know who it is, but everybody in every book group across the country is reading the same 15 or 20 books, uh, fiction books. So, you know, and that's like 1% of, of the fiction books that are out there, and the other 99% are selling three to 5,000 copies. So... What we need is an Occupy Fiction movement to, to uh, make up that discrepancy. But, um, <clears throat> so, yeah, it is, it is difficult to, to make a living as a fiction writer, uh, particularly if you don't make that cut. Um, whereas nonfiction, every topic sort of has a baseline audience, uh, people mm -hmm. who are interested in the topic and who will buy the book. And then if you're, you know, if you have good luck and, and get noticed in the press, that just builds on that. Um, and I have to say that one of the decisions, uh, one of the reasons I made the decision of moving from fiction to nonfiction is that I could make a living at it. Uh, mm -hmm. It was getting harder to make a living writing novels, even novels. Now, we're, you know, we're the, skipping the novel part of your career, where you right. went, uh, you kind of didn't go from lauded, highly literary short stories into, you know, highly literary novels, right? I mean, it was literary, but you went directly into the thriller genre, right? It was right. literary, they, they, literary they, thrillers, but they were thrillers. <laughs> right. I still haven't figured out what a literary thriller is, but I wrote... Two but they books. were using that term, weren't they? To describe they were, your book? They were. Yeah. Yeah, I think, I think it's just a thriller that's, you know, written decently and has believable characters in it. I, uh, that's the only thing I can figure out. Um, uh -huh. And the first one did pretty well, and uh, Random House contracted for a sequel, and I tried to write a sequel, but I couldn't. I was done with that character, so fortunately I was able to talk them into using the same contract for a different book, but now we, uh, so I got tired of that, too. I don't know. So are we talking bad chemistry or chaos theory that was first? The bad chemistry was the first one. So bad chemistry did well enough for them to want a sequel, and you took the right. principled stand that you had exhausted the literary potential of this character. I don't know how principled it was. I started, I wrote about 60 pages of a sequel, and I just said, you know, this, uh, I'm tired of this. Uh, this character, I've said what I, my, my main character was a uh, female cop, uh, right. and I had said what I wanted to say about her, and, and I'm just not the sequel writing type, I guess. Right. But. Now, I think 
if you're going to go into the thriller writing business, I think you really should abandon all principles and scruples. No, I don't mean that, 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 that kind mistake. of thing. <laughs> that was your mistake. You've got to go I one way or the other. Sold out halfway. That, that was the problem. Never sell out halfway is the, is the thing that's gotten me where I am today. Really? We're, we're, yes. Oh. I'm blogging at Stevie. Um, well, then I tried so, to write a totally literary, non-commercial book, and it was very successfully non-commercial. Uh, that was uh, extravagance. Uh, yeah. That was a very good book, though. And well, thank it, you. It points to something distinctive about you, actually, I think. Which it had this interesting analytical premise, which was that you that we were going through the, the, the dot com boom. I forget on which side of the crash we were as the book wrapped up, but the as you wrapped up the writing of it even. But um and you what you did was you it was a parallel histories thing where there was a character in an earlier time corresponding to the character in the modern time. Right. right. And 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 you, you I think it, there was a kind of an argument there about more of an argument maybe than there is in your current nonfiction book in a sense about actual parallels between the financial circumstances in this earlier era and you'll have to remind me when right. exactly that was and the dot com uh, era right when was the earlier right. era uh, it was late 17th century England mm -hmm. and it was a, uh, it was a, a, a similar kind of uh, technology bubble. Uh, right. that occurred to the 1990s in New York. And that's the kind of thing that, like, in fact, if you did write a history paper on that, arguing that there are these parallels, I would say that would be a little more analytical than the average act actual history paper. I mean, th there really was an argument there, kind of. And, uh, yeah. and that's, it, it, you know, it was also a good book, but, but, the, but what's distinctive about one thing I find distinctive about you is kind of how rigorously and analytically you think compared to many compared to many fiction compared writers. Compared to many fiction <laughs> Ooh, well, you're gonna get letters, man. You're gonna get letters. Well, no, I mean look look. Bring it on. <laughs> you know <laughs> I should be so lucky as to get many letters about anything. And, and I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean there there is the impressionistic side of of human the human mind, and there's the analytical side, and, and I don't want to stereotype it as some, some kind of left brain, right th brain thing, but there are these different modes of, of thought, kind of, um, and, and there are also different kinds of rigor. I mean, maybe that's what I want to say, you know. There, I mean, poets have a rigor, can think about poetry in a rigorous way that's still different from doing, like, historical analysis or something. Uh -huh. But you, um, I mean, I'm just saying I can imagine you having been like a social scientist, not in the sense of a historian, but in the, in the sense of something a little more analytical, maybe. And there are a lot of fiction writers I can't imagine. I can't imagine doing that. Does this not sound... Uh, it, it, do you yeah, wanna... it sounds vaguely plausible. Um, I, I wanted to be a marine biologist, actually, for a long time. You would have been a good one. You got that beard. Uh, yes. <laughs> right. Anyway, um, but I think, you know, it was because of extravagance that I got into nonfiction, I think, because I, doing all that research, I went to London several times. Uh, my wife accuses me of choosing book topics based on where I want to go to do the research. But uh, I went to London several times and did the research, and I really, really got into the historical research. And to a certain extent, I'm also a victim of my own demographics. I mean, middle-aged guys like nonfiction. I don't know. I don't know why they like, particularly history. Um, and, you know, there was a time in my life when I was reading 80% fiction and 20% nonfiction, and now I would say it's probably the reverse. Mm -hmm. But uh, you, you were never much of a fiction guy, were you? I never had that aspiration. I mean, I do. I do sometimes think it would really be fun to try and see. If I could write, no, a I'm even novel. talking about reading. I mean, do you read? Novels? Well, I've never been much of a reading guy. Period. I am so, <laughs> I'm so inefficient. I am so, I have such an attention problem that I just rarely read a whole book. Oh, um, no, so all of those books in your bibliographies, you've just sort of scanned through and. Cherished no, it isn't that I scan. It's that I, it's that it's that you know I am led by my research needs to the chapter that that. Is the one that's footnoted, and the, you know, in the footnotes uh, it says pages blah blah blah. Yeah, that's what I looked at. 
um, or that's where I, I got have the to opposite see. problem. I I have to read the whole book, uh, and and for instance, this Chicago book it was totally over researched. There was so much that I couldn't use. Um, mm-hmm. But anyway, go ahead. Um, where, where where was I going with that? Well, uh, so you're you're not much of a reader in general. So well, you're not no, fiction, yeah. right? Right. But this is like more about you than me. So. Uh, uh, I, I like fiction when I have a chance to read it. Um, uh-huh. I mean, I'm so pathetic. One summer I tried to read Moby Dick, only got halfway through it. So this summer I tried to read this little book by Nathaniel Philbrick called Why Read Moby Dick. It's like, it's like about 7,000 words. I only got halfway through that. It's pathetic. Really? Anyway. He, he, was, uh, one of, he was one of my models for uh, at least my, my first nonfiction book, the, the book about the avalanche. Uh, his book in the heart of the sea, which is based on the uh, story that Melville used for Moby Dick, is just right. Uh, the, the story of the Essex. That's what you should read, actually. That's what you should read. Really? Yeah. There was a, yeah, there was an right, actual. It's probably right, right there, and I can give it to you. It's probably right here. I'm on the island that Moby Dick is about. There's a lot of Moby Dick related stuff here. I can um, imagine. Yeah. The the uh, so anyway yeah now just to round it out so the White Cascade was your story of this avalanche uh, kind of a Donner Pass like story that had been lesser known that happened north of I guess where Donner Pass happened. Oh um, uh, yeah, nobody ate each other. <laughs> I mean, nobody ate each other. This impression. <laughs> but it was a great book uh, because uh, there was quite a bit of documentation of what had happened. These people are. Uh, it happens, what, about 100 years ago or something, a little more? Yeah, it was 1910. Uh, these two railroad trains were uh, on their way from Spokane to Seattle, mm-hmm. and the line goes right through the Cascade Mountains, some really wilderness areas, and uh, they got trapped in a snowstorm up there. The railroad was doing everything they could to get them off, um, but they ended up being trapped up there for days, and finally a, a huge slab avalanche broke loose on the on the slope above them and knocked both trains off the side of the mountain into a ravine and uh, ended up killing like 96 people. It was, that, that was another thing where it was the deadliest avalanche in American history, but nobody had heard about it. Yeah, that um, was a real find on your part. Yeah. Uh, and the it documentation was, the was Pacific there. Northwest. I'm sorry? The, I said, and the documentation was there because there had been a, a trial. I guess there had been lawsuits or inquiries or right. something. So a lot had been transcribed about what happened, and there were people who were writing things down while they were trapped on the train and so on. So right. that made, and this brings us back to what it may be the conser- that some conservatives, at least, or what the Weekly Standard liked about your book. The, the amount of documentation allowed you to tell a truly fairly fine-grained narrative story, you know, kind of fully fleshed out, without departing from or, or extrapolating from or interpolating from the actual historical record. You didn't put any quotes in people's mouths. You didn't, you know, ima- you, know you, you didn't pretend you knew more about what they were thinking or saying than, than you said. Yeah, why, why would that appeal more to conservatives than anyone else? Well, I don't know, but here's what happened is in the Weekly Standard Review, I only got as far as the part where I had to subscribe to the Weekly Standard to read the rest. <laughs> so I've only read the first three paragraphs of the review, and it so happens that that's the way they start out. Preparation, Bob. Preparation. That's that's what, hey, that is the watchword of Blogging Heads TV, Gary. Uh-huh. Uh, uh-huh. The, um, but anyway, they. I, I can actually... You know, they started out talking about this. There's been so much controversy lately over, you know, what the difference between fact and fiction. It's so right, refreshing to see Gary Chris in this yeah. latest book, not in the White Cascade, in this latest book, you say up front, everything in this book, you know, I'm, there's no stretching the truth. Everything is documented. None of the quotes are made up, blah, blah, blah. And so they love you for that up front. And it seems plausible, I, although... There shouldn't be an ideological bias in favor of the truth, you're right. We should all like it. But um, but I thought maybe that's that was your theory about why conservatives would like like the new book, City of Scoundrels. Do you have another theory? No, no. I, my theory is that I rehabilitate or semi-rehabilitate the reputation of a Republican uh, mayor who is 
almost universally reviled by historians. In 1994, the guy, Big Bill Thompson is the guy I write about, and he was, he was no uh, Fiorello LaGuardia, that's for sure, but he, he had been caricatured, his enemies were the ones who went on to write the histories, by and large, and so he was caricatured as a buffoon, a blubbering jungle hippopotamus, and things like that. Mm -hmm. um, and things, certain things about him were ignored, like the fact that he was, uh, he brought, he doubled the number of African Americans in the Chicago Police Department. He named a lot of African Americans to high uh, office in his administration. Mm -hmm. And this was at a time when, you know, alleged progressives like Woodrow Wilson were segregating the federal government. So I, I give him credit for that. So I think that the fact that I, I sort of said some nice things about a mayor who was called the worst mayor in American history, who also happened to be a Republican, the last Republican mayor of Chicago, may be part of it. And I also do take some pot shots at early 20th century progressives. Now, you know, one of the unfortunate aspects of contemporary uh, discourse is that liberals can't call themselves liberals anymore, so they call themselves progressives, but a 21st century progressive is not the same as a 20th century progressive. And uh, Quite the the progressives were, yeah, they were terrible on race. They were really terrible on race. And, and I say as much in the book uh, numerous times, and I think that that may maybe appeal to, appeals to them. I, you know, I take pot shots at progressives, so. Yeah. They were also in favor of eugenics and stuff. I mean, this is, this is right. part of oh, this yeah. is fodder. Part of this is fodder for Jonah Goldberg and his liberal fascism thesis. Um, and, and then Woodrow Wilson was, I guess, very bad on uh, civil liberties, certainly during the war. But um, uh -huh. the, uh, so, uh, Okay, so where were we about to head? Okay, so that's your theory about what can... You, 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 you don't buy my theory that it's your adherence to truth and justice and uh, you know, uh, the way that, that it gives you to conservatives. You, you, you're, you're, no, uh, because I, I think there is evidence that... Well, I'm not going to get into politics. So, um, but well, I, there's I, evidence that conservatives think, are, are dirty button liars. Water. What would you say? <laughs> There's evidence that conservatives are dirty button liars. Is that what you were going to say? <laughs> uh, or or they, they certainly have some unique beliefs, as we've discovered. Uh, you know, the best, line, the best line I've heard about the Todd Akins thing was uh, a friend of mine on Facebook posted, I wonder how Todd Akins feels about having a bunch of uh, old white men tell him whether or not to abort. I, I'm not hearing laughter, Bob. That's a... That's a, that's a I, it took me a while to get it. It's a, it we're talking about a, an abort double entendre joke. I always, I always hesitate before laughing publicly at abortion-related jokes. That's there's, true. There's this, there's this censor that it insists that the joke pass a rigorous screening process. But I'm now, I'm now R O T F L. Um. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So. Uh, so, like, then what next? I mean, you, you've, so you, you, are you, have you settled into this, these last two books, uh, kind of regional American history books, right, uh, in a certain sense? Uh, although, not to deny the larger significance that, and larger drama That's that right. both carry, but, but, um, uh, but both happened in a particular part. Of America, uh, have you settled into this? Is is what's going to become your calling? Point? Well, I, I'm I'm working on a book about New Orleans now, between 1890 and 1920. Um, you know, to tell a coherent narrative, it kind of has to play out in a particular locale. So I, mm -hmm. I don't think of it as regional history. That's that's a word I don't want to be associated. with. I take with it back. But, uh, <laughs> urban, call it urban history. Um, urban. No, and you know, I I have not given up fiction. I do think that I am going to go back to fiction. I've had uh, a number of ideas crop up in the course of my research. I do think it is going to be historically based fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it's going to be a contemporary tale of love among 20-somethings or anything like that. Uh, I do think it will be some history-related thing. Um, and I do, I do miss writing fiction. Um, and hope I will return to it. But right now, I'm, I'm really uh, feeling pretty fulfilled by 
doing this uh, nonfiction narrative thing, so for the time and, and being it, at least. And it does seem more commercially viable, so far as you can tell, than uh, fiction? It does seem to be, yeah. And it also takes me to New Orleans for research trips, so... Can't beat that. That's, and do you develop, like, regional constituencies for these books? Is that a virtue? Well, judging by that that uh, thing that they have on Amazon that, that tells you where your book is selling, uh, the Avalanche book is selling heavily in the Pacific Northwest. The Chicago book is selling uh, heavily in the Midwest. So, yeah. Although New Orleans, I think, maybe has a more widespread appeal. I, I don't know. Well, it's become, um, we'll see about it's that. become iconic for different reasons lately. Um, yeah. So, like, how are you finding, I mean, how are you feeling about the, 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 whole, the whole book biz, the future of things? I'm feeling fairly optimistic about books, somewhat less optimistic about commercial publishing. Um, hmm. Right. You know, I, I, I really wonder if 10, 15 years from now we're going to have commercial publishers um, because it's becoming less and less clear what value they're adding. Particularly, uh, you know, I love the people at my publisher, but uh, they didn't do that much. You know, there wasn't that much editing going on and things like that. Um, there is the gatekeeper aspect to it. Um, you know, when you have a book come out through a Random House company, I guess it's taken more seriously. The credentialing. But how long the is, of... Yeah, how long is that going to last, I wonder. Um, so, You're certainly seeing books not coming out, you know, because kind of self-published books uh, that, are, that are starting to get attention. Um, right. But, I mean, there are, there are book review sections and other endangered species that just make this, uh, this policy that they will not review a self-published book, mm -hmm. even if it's by someone who is, you know, well-known and, and credentialed. So, um, you know, <clears throat> that is is a question mark for for commercial publishing. But I think that you know, books are selling. Books continue to sell. At least my agent tells me that. And um, I do think that there will be a continuing need for uh, long form narrative. Uh, I know that I you know when I'm on the internet, I just uh, get sick after a while of hearing so many people. You know, particularly if you read Twitter feed or something like that, it's just so many people yelling uh, at once that you really want to sit down with one other consciousness who's going to tell you about one specific thing. And I don't think that's going to go away. So, you know, all this mm -hmm. talk about, you know, diminishing attention spans and stuff like that, you know, they've been talking about that for a long, long time, and people are still reading books. Um, yeah, there but may be a... Yeah, it seems like there's another argument that isn't about um, diminishing, uh, you know, attention spans, but it's about a, a choice of media, right? It's it's a lot easier. Like I just watched the, the Da Vinci Code for unclear reasons. The movie. Oh God! <laughs> I know, I know. I was at, I was at home alone, and whatever it happened. Okay, uh -huh. I, I feel bad about it. You don't have to rub it in. And I hadn't read the book, but you know, it's just it's just so easy to indulge. If we're talking fiction, for starters, or even narrative nonfiction, although I think we would have to put the Da Vinci Code in the fiction category, um, the, uh, the you know it, it's easier, simpler, less effortful to in, indulge the the impulse to imbibe narrative, you know, in 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 audiovisual form, um, and and also. Uh, uh, you know, in some ways richer, I mean, especially with nonfiction. I mean, you know, in nonfiction, you know, in a New York Times story, somebody go to great lengths to describe how some person looks or something. Mm -hmm. And they never, you know, it's, it's impossible to really do a very good job of evoking the actual appearance of the person. And watching the person speak can be so much more powerful. So, uh -huh. and it just seems to me in both nonfiction and fiction, the economics of audiovisual media are, and may, maybe this is true of nonfiction and fiction, but... Uh, and actually maybe less true of historical nonfiction, but anyway, that, that I would think a certain amount of the competition is coming from there. I mean, you know, time is finite. People have only so much time in their day. If, they, if, yeah. if, there, if there is more appealing stuff on TV, and I think 
If you look at the demographic that used to do the highbrow reading in this country and still does some of it, they're finding more on TV that's appealing because of the new economics of TV. Well, that just yeah. leaves less time to read. No, that's true. That's true. Uh, and that, you know, it's amazing how many people think that they're paying you a compliment when they say, oh, it should be a movie. Your book should be a movie. Right. Um, I do think that audiovisual presentation enables you to uh, convey a lot of information more efficiently. You know, mm -hmm. as you say, you get to see what everybody looks like, so you don't have to read a description of them. But I think there are other things that you get through reading that you, you can't get through a, a narrative film. Uh, there are all kinds of textures and sub-details that uh, I think you can get out of a book that you maybe wouldn't get mm -hmm. out of a movie. Mm -hmm. um, I, but, I think uh, that... I think to write, uh, and there are things you can get out of a 100-mile hike through the Appalachians that you can't get through a walk in the park, but, you know, <laughs> how many people, you know, it's a, it's a question of how much time there is in the, I don't know, we'll, we'll see. I mean, you know, obviously I'm rooting, I'm rooting for books. You know, on the question of commercial publishers, I guess, that you brought up, whether, whether, and, 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 and I do think it's important to distinguish between their future and the future books. Um, I mean, they do, what do they do historically? They are supposed to edit, have often in the past, for a long time now, not done much of that, right. except for copy editing. Um, they got the physical books out there, but, they, they, well, they produced the physical book and got it out there. That is obviously going to be of declining significance as more books are electronic. Um, mm -hmm. They, you're right, they credentialized uh, the book, uh, and that may be of declining significance, and they, and they did marketing, they, publicity. Right. In my experience... But, I mean, an author, an author can hire a publicist himself, you know. Well, or do the, I mean, in my experience, a lot of it came from my own, you know, yeah. Yeah, my own true too. effort, and... Now, I mean, they, they were always, they always played a valuable role, but one irony, the publishers that is, and the publicity, one irony is that it seems much more common now for publishers when evaluating an author and deciding whether to take a big gamble on the book to say, what is his or her platform, right? right. Like, like yeah. what is their publicity platform? And the reason I say that's ironic is because for reasons we described, it may be the case that if publishers in the future can't make the case that they are the platform, that they're doing the marketing, well, then there's just no need for them whatsoever. You know, if I were a publisher and wanted to make a case for my future existence, I would spend less time asking what the author's platform is and more time exhibiting my ability to actually get them some damn publicity. Um, and, you know, and, and I think it's not that they, again, all my publishers have done at least some of that, and some of them have done it very well. I do think in a lot of houses, it's a feast and famine thing where they pick three books that they're going to lavish their resources on, you know, and the rest right. are more or less neglected. Mm -hmm. yeah. But enough about my views on publishing, Gary. <laughs> um, the, the, uh, so how did you, did, did you play a big role in promoting this book or other books? I did. Yeah. I, I, there was one, Hellish week in Chicago when they had me doing three things a day, um, either a talk or TV, radio thing, and it, it, I don't thrive on that stuff, and I was miserable for that week. And but it, you know, a, a lot of media has stretched over uh, beyond that. They, I didn't go on a big tour aside from you know Chicago, mm -hmm. um, but. Um, you know, there was a lot of Chicago media that interest in this book, I guess, uh, because not that many books are written about Chicago, even though it really is, I think, an incredibly interesting city. I love Chicago. Um, yeah, yeah. And it, I, I think one of the things I argue on one of the last pages of the book is that it, it has turned into one of the most uh, architecturally interesting and physically impressive cities in the Americas, maybe the mm -hmm. most. Mm -hmm. um, Anyway, and it's got this bad rep, or uh, maybe that's disappearing now. You know, it has this rep as a grimy industrial city, which it is not, uh, at least not uh, in in its central area. But um, yeah. So yeah, 
you know, I love radio genre. stuff. I, I, it, it, uh, you know, I really do like to go back into my hermetic writer's existence. So um, I, I was miserable. I don't, I don't thrive on media the way you do, Bob. So, so. Oh. Uh, so that's why you come to Blogging Heads instead of <laughs> real media. You're tired of real media. You're tired of getting that's actual right. attention. I'm tired of real media. Yeah. I, I, I may I may regret having done this. I don't know. I don't know. Did you think you think you may have said something? You think you may have Did said something? Did we get something? too informal? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I, I also uh, I think. Are you worried that you'll me. you'll lose the dueling beards competition here? Oh, I, I've seen your beard. I'm not worried about that. <laughs> <laughs> you don't have to worry. This is vacation growth. It's going away soon. Don't worry. We've seen uh, nearly the last of it. Um, so, yeah, well, do you think you've said something you'll advise maybe in the course of this? Because if so, I would like to make sure you know, I keep <laughs> make track sure of it and publicize it. <laughs> no, I, I, made, I made claims that my, uh, my subtitle was not perhaps... Uh, lived up to in the, the book. part where you've called your publisher a dirty rotten liar. <laughs> oh yeah, let's let's edit that out. Yeah. Okay. No, I didn't, I didn't. I didn't. do that. No, you didn't. I'm kidding. It's a joke. Um. R O F L M. Oh. Oh, I've got acronym. Yeah. No, it was it was it was a uh, perfectly legitimate subtitle. I've got some subtitle stories for you, but unlike you, I have the wisdom not to tell them in public. <laughs> um, okay, so anything else you want to say about your glorious career? You know, I, I will say, you know, people should read your books. All of them. From the Garden that, State. That sounds good, yes. From the Garden State through City of Scoundrels and including the rest. Yeah, you know, I think my I think my best book is the one that nobody has read, which is Bone by Bone, my second short story collection. Uh, well, yeah, maybe one final thing we could talk about is that because you you took uh, a slightly different direction. Those were like edgier stories than the Garden State. Right. I mean, the Garden right. State; those were very um, they were very sophisticated and everything, uh, but they weren't. Yeah, they weren't edgy. They were kind of warm. I mean. And I thought right. I thought that was your, one of the glories of the book was that you 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 you, you the characters were largely likable people and I think an important function of all of us but maybe of, of artists is to is to at least at times illuminate what's good in pretty much everyone you know there's no entirely bad person and well maybe there have been there's not many um, and. Uh, and I thought that was good, but but then you did take a different you did take a different turn in bone by bone, right? Right. Yes. There, that was no more Mister Nice Guy. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you and, and and you remain committed to that. Uh, I mean, how did I don't really remember how how the uh, how that worked out critically for you. I know you your your view is that short stories just generally don't sell, and that, and and your two books of short stories uh, had that in common. But you got pretty good reviews for Bone by Bone, didn't you? I did. Yeah. Um, but it it didn't even make paperback. Uh, I remember the head of uh, the the first one came out as a vintage paperback, and at a certain point, uh, Marty Asher came up to me and said, "You know, your second book is better than your first book, but we're not going to publish it." <laughs> he was he was the head of vintage books at that point. Right, he right. Um, he may still be uh, for all. He I may know. he may still be. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Anyway. So anyway, you're you're so that's the book you would recommend above all else, bone by bone. No, actually, I would recommend City of Scoundrels above all else. Above all else, see, you're rising up. Yeah, I've seen your yeah. wisdom grow in the course of this conversation. <laughs> it, you're, that you're is, my you're my master, Bob. So that that is mm -hmm. the book you are pushing at the moment. Yes. Uh huh. Exactly. But but. Well worth it. All your books are. Um, and thank you for um, spending this time with us. All right. Well, I, I don't you know. think you'll regret it. I don't think you'll regret it. Oh, good. Okay. I think you'll discover that no one's watching anyway. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Okay. Thanks, Gary. All right. Thank you. See you. Okay. See you.